now and I'm going to cut every I'm going to mute everybody uh, mute all and then I'm going to bring Gillian back into it so that's what we'll do um, so I'm going to unmute Gillian just like old times it will be with Gillian I can't unmute her why can't oh yes I can that's okay right so um, Gillian it's just me and you now there's nobody else about it's just you and me yeah, it, 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 it's just like old times. It really, just really like is. old times. Just like old times. You, you do like the sound of your voice, so so that's good. <laughs> so um, right, anyway. So um, so Gillian, um, you know the usual uh, the old fashioned lectures I used to do used to go around the room and I used to ask everybody what they knew about different bits and bobs. But on this one, um, I don't know if you started off with our with with this series i don't think you did and no. names cluellen bren and ivor bach may be familiar with the likes of dell um and goff and maybe catherine uh, but when if i mention the the names um ivor bach and cluellen bren um what does that spring to your mindset just sort of gently what what does that say were they welsh princes that that's that's a really good that's a really good start anything else uh, did they fight any battles? Uh, the answer is yes. This is a scratch and sniff, isn't it? One more. It? One. Because really, I don't know anything about them. Well, do you know, that, that's a lot more than lots of people, actually. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more than anyone that I've asked about my lecture tomorrow, which is about the um, English Armada. Um, but you'll um, no doubt hear about that from the notes and you're welcome to join us tomorrow Gillian. So okay. I, I would like to um, I would like to start off with a few um, a few pensive uh, points. Um, Ivor Bach, um, the character that we're going to be looking at today, um, otherwise known as um, Ivor the Short, uh, which is actually something I didn't actually know really. Ivor Bach, which does mean a short or small Ivor um, otherwise known as Ivor Ap Myrig. Uh, um, and you know what we're going to do? You know, you know the, the thing I, I loved doing is getting this um, annotation little thing so I can actually draw on it. So um, what we're going to be looking at is this area here, um, mainly for the rest of the evening. This is, this is an old, um, this is the old sort of native um, county um, of... Um, Glamorgan, um, Morganog, um, and this is sort of lost in the uh, valleys at this minute. Um, this is known as Senhenev. Um, and what we do know about Senhenev is it, it's very much steeped in lots of myths and legends, and it's um, steeped in things that um, are very odd with the native landscape of our wonderful land. When I say very odd, it's got there's something known as the Senhenev Dyke. Around, um, around part of Senhenev, there's, there's a huge deer park dyke around it. it it's, it's very strange. Um, it's a bit like Office Dyke in, in, in the middle of um, Glamorgan, really. It's very strange. So we look at Ivor Bach, and um, then we go on to his successor, who's otherwise known as Llewellyn Bren. So when we're talking about um, um, Ivor Bach, we're talking around the 1150s um, and with the likes of, um, I'm admitting somebody now, with, with the likes of Llewellyn Bren, um, we're talking about his death was in 1316. He's believed to have been um, born sometime in about um, the 12, um, 1260s. So he, he was uh, in his middle ages when Llewellyn Bren died, but Ivor Bach has another little bit more of a story, which is a quite a strange story. So without further ado, um, what, what we're going to quickly do is, obviously we know where Cardiff is, and then part of the lecture will mention Kenfig as well, because the backdrop actually behind me is actually Kenfig Castle. Um, and, and Dell's been shouting at the screen saying, I know where that is, but I'm not talking to him tonight, except for the end. So um, Ivor Bach. So um, anyone that will, will know about Ivor Bach will, will know a little bit about uh, the Earl of Gloucester. Um, and then again, we don't know much more about him other than his, one of his descendants, Llewellyn Bren. 
So we're going to get Ivor back out of the way first. So let's do that. Um, and here we go. I've got all of my little marks on the screen, so let's clear my drawings. Uh, this is this is um, this is our wonderful Ivor Bach. Um, now, interestingly enough, is um, the likes of um, Kasteth Koch um, linked to the wonderful Ivor Bach? Now, um, I'm, I'm mentioning that rather interestingly enough. Now. I mentioned Kasteth Koch and um, Taft's Wells and so on um, because that sort of landscape is, is sort of part of um, the landscape of Senechenev, uh, except you can argue whether it's in the landscape of Rondekun and Taft now. But I mentioned Kasteth Koch um, and it's once believed that the original castle of Kasteth Koch was very much um, associated with Ivor Bach um, in 1158. Um, and there he is, Ivor Bach, typical hero of this wonderful land. And associated with Ivor Bach is quite a legendary story, associated with um, the, um, the, the Earl of Gloucester um, and Countess Hawis. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about that shortly. There she is. There's a Countess behind um, wonderful Ivor Bach. Try, I'm just try, going to try not to get too nationalistic. So anyway, Ivor Bach, Ivor ap Myrig, uh, Lord of St. Henneth, um, was um, a, a leader, a prince, a lord, or however you'd like to refer to him, of St. Henneth. Um, at this period, we're talking about the 1150s, um, the Normans hadn't conquered that part of um, Morganog, Glamorgan. In fact, um, in the 1150s, they had already conquered the likes of um, Cowbridge and the likes of Ogmore um, and Barry and, and, and Cardiff and uh, large tracts of Gwent. But St. Henneth was still held by um, this Lord of Cymru, this Lord of Wales. Um, and he was one of those hill-like lords who hung on to the hills, um, one of the lords of the hills we would say. Um, and there's a story a few weeks ago, and I mentioned about the fear that people had in Cardiff and Caerphilly and Lantrison, associated with Llewellyn, um, Llewellyn Bren, who comes along in the 1100s. So there was this fear of those upland people, those upland lords that are of noble native stock um, of those damnable Welsh used in the right context. Um, Ivor at Myrig, um, holding this land um, in the upland areas, um, bounded in the north by Brecon, the, the landscape of the Brecon Beacons, between the River Taff and the Rumney River, a slither of land. He was one um, with, his, with his allies that held out against the Normans, those damnable Normans. But um, in 1158, um, the, the lords of the landscape, William Fitz Robert, Earl of Gloucester, decided to attack um, Gwent um, and eradicated the Welsh menace in, in Gwent, for example. The reason why I'm using this word Welsh menace, I'm talking from a Norman point of view. So in 1158, um, the... the, the, the um, the princes of Cymru from Gwent uh, were extinguished. Their, their sense of being an independent um, prince, princeship of, of the land of Cymru was gone, and now it belonged to those damnable Normans. And who was next? Ivor Bach. Ivor Bach was next. And in lots of ways, Ivor Bach saw himself as a native prince. He was of princely stock, but the Normans referred to him as the, as the Welshling Lord. In fact, they actually referred to him as a tenant. He's only this little guy up there somewhere, St. Henry the Way, um, who's got a little bit of land. He's a, he's a, he's a Welsh Lord. Um, and he paid taxes to the likes of William Fitz um, Robert in 1158. Gloucester was trying to take land which under Welsh law, the law of the Cymru belonged to Ivor. 
And Ivor wanted none of this. He wanted to, um, he wanted to exact revenge for the loss of his friend and counterpart in Gwent, um, Morgan Ap Owen, who was killed by William Fitzrobert in 1158. Um, and the day was to come um, that we've got a rather interesting story. Um, and the interesting story is associated with Cardiff. Anyone that's been to Cardiff will know this story. It's quite a little story, actually. Um, and we can turn to Geraldus Cambrensis for the notation of the events in 1158. Um, and in 1158, the Geraldus Cambrensis is um, writing in about 1191. He's Gerald of Wales, Gerald of Barry. Um, <laughs> Ivor is said to have scaled the walls of Cardiff Castle. Not these walls, not um, these walls here, and not these walls, and not here, um, not here either, not really much here, but he scaled the walls of this shell keep, this one here. Uh, interestingly enough, he had to go down a bank, an upper bank, and he scaled these walls according to the likes of Geraldus Cambrensis, which is rather, rather interesting. Um, could it be done? Well, um, I'm not really sure whether it could be done or not. However, so if you look at the back of the castle, um, obviously what we're seeing is um, this here, uh, um, if we can get to my cursor, this was all rebuilt um, by the likes of um, the Marquis of Butte and under the um, direction of the architect William Burgess. But interesting enough, um, what did survive from the medieval period was this mound, this, and this wonderful ditch, which now today is full of water. But this ditch itself is probably not from back in the day, and maybe nor are these trees. One thing I will say is that Cardiff Castle, um, the, the entire, um, if, we, if we sort of look here, the entire ground print is actually uh, based on um, an original um, Roman um, fortification. And when William Burgess actually started excavating here um, in 1877, he found the ground plan of the original Roman fort. So, so this is what you see. But anyway, back to the story. Um, Ivor scaled the walls of Cardiff Castle using his bare hands, it's said, by the likes of Geraldus Cambrensis. Now, the Geraldus Cambrensis is the one who tells us a lot about Gwentlian. But I tell you what, that looks very impregnable, doesn't it? Um, extremely impregnable. Um, he sees the Earl, uh, the Earl of Gloucester, the second Earl of Gloucester, William Fitzrobert, which was of royal blood. Um, and he also um, captured his wife, Countess Hawise, um, a daughter of the Earl of Leicester, um, and their young son, Robert, and kidnapped all of them to the woods of Senhenith. Now, I do like this story, but um, I'm trying to work out how you managed to um, spirit these three individuals out of that castle in the first place. But you know what? Quoting the likes of um, Brian Davis of pont le saying, never, never um, diss the legends and the storytelling of our forefathers, like Geraldus Cambrensis. Um, and what we're, basically, what we're basically seeing is probably, um, probably maybe, um, in the, the time of Ivo Bach, the, this bit of the wall at the back, the Roman wall, was extremely ruinous. So we'd have just gone over that, up the bank, and into the castle. But was it as impressive back then as the shell keep that we'll go back to? Um, was it as impressive as this? And probably it wasn't. Um, it was probably more of a slighter wall, which explains why um, Ivo Bach, Bach managed to spirit out um, the Earl of Gloucester and his wife and their son Robert um, and he, he whipped them off to Senhenith, to the landscape of Senhenith and he refused to release them until he had recovered the land he had lost and a lot more. So it said. Now do you know what, you know what I like to do is refer to the old books. Well, Michelle um, has been digging into the old um, archive online um, and she's managed to pick up a book for a wee 11 quid. 
a book from 1874. It's a book entitled um, History of Glamorgan by a member of the Nichols family. Oh, enough of that. Um, and the story about Ivor Bach um, and the likes of um, Castef Cork, I'm going to read out that for you in a moment. And one thing, alas, I was unable to copy out the image um, of um, Castef Cork before it was rebuilt in the late 1870s, 1880s by William Burgess's um, men um, under the uh, monies used by the third Marcus of Butte. So anyway, before we actually get there, a um, bit of a ramble. Um, if any of you want to know where the likes of um, the wall of Cardiff is gone, i.e. this wall here, the old town wall, unfortunately there are only two bits of it left. Um, if anyone's looking for bits of the old medieval Cardiff, this is probably all one of two bits of the wall of Cardiff the original town wall that actually survives. And interesting enough, Gillian, if you can peep over here, can you see the original Roman wall there? Yeah? The, yeah. The, that, the, the, the sandstone there, not the sandstone, the sandstone is the stuff that was placed on top of the Roman, uh, Roman wall by William uh, Burgess, um, is, is stonemasons and so on. But that there, here, is actually the original Roman wall. And that there is um, red rather sandstone. And this here is obviously from other quarries. So we've got a nice bit of history in one moment there, uh, telling you a great deal about what's going on. Anyway, moving on again. Do you know what? When, when I'm doing these lectures, I'm very aware that I do get carried away. Um, and just a little bit more about Cardiff. And, and that's the other bit of wall um, in, in Cardiff. Now, the bit of wall that you've just seen, that's obvious where that is. Um, if you look at the center of Cardiff Castle, uh, and you go over to the right, you can see this little bit of wall. If you cross the road there, directly where the crossing is, and go a little bit towards the left, towards the Pearl Assurance building, there's a weird little dark lane. And guess what we've got down it? We've got another bit of wall, another bit of the original wall uh, of Cardiff. And that's all we've got. Isn't it, isn't it a shame that we've lost all these bits of walls in Cardiff, isn't it? It's not like a, it's not like a wonderful York, is it? So we've lost so much in Cardiff, and lots of what we lost in Cardiff has only, only been over the last 60 to 70 years, including what's underneath the Pearl Assurance building that um, towers over this little bit of wall, the, the Grey Friars, and that was all lost um, in the late 1960s. Terrible job. Um, so moving on again. And we've got um, this here, and, and looking, at, looking at the plan as well, uh, this is much. This is much after the likes of. Um, this is much after where we're looking at the time in the 1100s. This is as uh, the likes of William Burgess is sort of looking to restylize the castle. This is about the 1850s, and then what happens to sort of make the castle appropriate for the Marquis of Butte? Um, all these houses are removed. All these houses are removed that's removed, this is demolished, that's demolished, that's demolished, um, that's demolished, that's demolished, that's demolished. All these buildings are demolished uh, to give way for what the third Marquis of Butte wants in the um, late 1870s. But anyway, bit back to the lecture again, please do. Um, let's learn a little bit more about Ivor Bach and Llewellyn Brown. Um, so um, again, nice little map of Cardiff that we're gonna come up to at the end. Um, and what we're going to basically mention, um, as we're sort of, um, we'll go back to this map again. Um, and if I'm, if I'm writing thinking, hang on a minute, just move on a little bit more. Hang on. Where's my image of Castell Cork? My image of Castle Cork seems to, seems to have disappeared. Can I just um, go, go out of here a minute and just see that where my image of Castell Cork has gone? Uh, da -da 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 -da. We seem to have lost my image of Castor Cork for a moment. Not a problem. So let's go back to where I was. Okay. A bit muddled at this minute, but don't worry. Right. A little bit more about Ivor Bach. Um, and then what we're going to do is go on to um, Llewellyn Bren. Uh, and this comes from the Nichols book, page 74. Following the Taff, a few miles to the interior, we come in view of Castor Cork, the Red Castle. So called by reason of the colour of its stones, 
taken probably from the durable red dolerite of the Radha beds. This picturesque ruin stands boldly on a craggy um, um, outcrop facing the Taff, high enough to command a view of the channel beyond Cardiff. And of the mountain gorges and passes inland, a most important post to watch and guard against incursions from the Vale of Glamorgan into the hilly parts and the contrary. Well, this was a perfect location at Castell Cork, by the way, because this would keep at bay the Normans going north into St. Henry. The age of the structure is not known, but the spot is believed to be the site of the castle of Ivorbach, the chieftain of short stature, uh, but of spirit, mentioned by Geraldus, who, as we said, broke into Cardiff Castle, carried off William, Earl of Gloucester, his wife and son, into the woods and declined their release until his demands were fully satisfied. It's likely that his demands were satisfied and obviously they were all released eventually, so that's fine. That's what we know about that story. The present castle is thought to be a Norman work of later date than Ivor's time, but of its builder and its subsequent history, history next to nothing is known. Ivor Bach, at the very time um, of the above exploit, was holding his lands in fear of the Lord of Glamorgan, as we've already mentioned. And that's really all we know about Ivor Bach at this stage. There's a little bit more that we can say about Ivor Bach in the future, but not tonight. So what we're going to do then is um, we're going to look at the other fella known as Llewellyn Bren. That's a good old Welsh name, isn't it? If you've ever heard one, Gillian. Yes. <clears throat> nice one. So Llewellyn Bren comes into the story associated with this man. Does anyone, um, well, when I say does anyone know, this is the family crest of the de Clare family. And interestingly enough, something that you don't find in the history is that until 1114, um, it's almost as if Llewellyn Bren was, um, uh, was the custodian for the Norman de Clare family whilst they were battling up in Scotland. So in other words, the, 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 this Lord Llewellyn Bren was sort of on talking terms with the Normans in the south. Um, and at that point, you know, this was the time that uh, these, all they are is, is Lords of Cymru. There's, there's no princes or anything. That was all quelled 30 years earlier um, with the war against um, Llewellyn at Gruffydd, which ended, um, as we all know, on the 11th of December in 1282. Llewellyn Bren. So this is a shield of, um, um, of our Gilbert de Clare. Um, Llewellyn Bren died in 1318, otherwise known as Llewellyn at Gruffydd, um, at Rhys. Um, Llewellyn, son of Gruffydd, Llewellyn, son of Rhys. Um, he was a nobleman, and he was well respected, may I add, by the English crown. He had been respected by the likes of Edward I. Now, Edward I didn't respect anybody. But um, the declares said, you know, he's an okay geezer. He may be Welsh, but he's a good chap. So when he kept all the older bits of St. Hennif, um, and up until 1316, he was in talking terms with the English crown until there was a revolt. The revolt would be the last serious challenge to English rule for another um, 50 odd years until about 1370. And then we got the England Rebellion in the 1400s. Um, and what happened, as some of you are already aware, is that Llewellyn Bren was executed. Uh, he was executed by the very despised Hugh Dispenser the Younger. But I'm missing a bit of the history, aren't I? I've just run ahead of myself. Um, what happened is this. Llewellyn Bren was on talking terms with the English, with the Normans, of minor royal house of the Cantrep of St. Hennif and a descendant of Ivor Bach, his great-great-grandfather. So he was of great fighting stock, may I add. His father was Gruffydd at Rhys. Llewellyn is conjectured jectured to have been born in 1267. So um, you can work out, he's, he's, he's in his middle, middle age um, when all these weird events are occurring in 1316. Um, Gilbert de Clare um, was a good landlord and, um, you know, Llewellyn Bren would pay taxes to um, Gilbert de Clare and, he, and Llewellyn Bren was asked to, he was trusted. 
he was to be custodian over the de Clare's estates whilst Gilbert de Clare was away in, uh, um, in Scotland. But those that know the true story, um, which this is a true story, is that um, before, the reason why Llewellyn Bren went in open revol revolt was that Gilbert de Clare was killed at the Battle of Bannockburn. And that was a terrible thing indeed, because um, Gilbert de Clare had taken large numbers of men and women, some women, men, lots of men from Glamorgan to fight alongside him at the Battle of Bannockburn. And what happened after June, um, in the year 1314, after the death of Gilbert de Clare, was that, uh, was that the south of England and Wales was in pandemonium because the de Clares were of great landowning stock. Um, and then comes in the likes of Hugh Dispenser the Younger. Um, and what really happens next is that there's a huge power vacuum. It's a very, very nasty power vacuum. Um, and what happens is that um, Llewellyn Bren is told to, in not so, um, not so many words, to bugger off. Um, it was now the dispensers who was to, to rule over. They needn't have any help off those horrible Welsh. They didn't want any help off them. And if more, let's just, um, let's just get rid of the Welsh once and for all. Now, in fact, that's not what Edward II wanted, actually. But I think Hugh Dispenser, who held Caffili Castle, um, was, was, not, was not playing the game, okay? He was not a nice man at all. Not nice at all. Um, and basically, um, the, the people um, of Glamorgan uh, were being persecuted by the Dispensers. Um, and they also started to despise a certain pain um, de Turberville, and that's where we're going to go next. So where, this is where we are. We've got some facts. We've moved into 1315, um, and there is Llewellyn Bren himself. Quite an image of fan fantasifulness, but the Llewellyn Bren revolt was quite a large revolt, really. It stretched... Um, over much of South Wales, it, it stretched from Monmouth um, all the way through Glamorgan up into those upland areas of Glamorgan, th those hilly areas, and went all the way then over to West Wales, interestingly enough, um, over to um, Denevor Castle. Um, so, you know, we got a big rebellion going on here, and it, it was a very popular rebellion indeed, because what the what the the Spencer family were doing, and the likes of Payne de Turberville, was to, was to force the people of the whole landscape to pay more taxes. And there wasn't much money around. You know, most, lots of the men had died fighting alongside their Lord Gilbert de Clare at Bannockburn. Oh, what a, what a to do. Um, and what I, what I thought today is to sort of, um, is, is to really um, try and look at some of the sites. So the first site we're going to look at now is, is Coity. Um, when anyone ever looks at Coity, so if we look at that image, you always think, what is the original castle? Well, what did the original castle at Coity look like? Well, if you, if you speak to any local people, they're obsessed with tunnels being dug all the way from the castle, all the way to um, Ogmore, um, and you think, right, let's have a little bit more information. And a little bit more information, um, is, is very much based on, um, if we look at this plan, so the, the castle that um, has never really been captured by any um, Welsh traitor, by any um, prince or lord of Cymru, um, this, was a, this was a site held by Payne de Turberville of Coity. Um, and the original castle was in fact these, um, these lower walls here, the curtain wall, um, probably a lesser gateway, not this big building here, not this building, not this bridge. Um, and it's very likely that this was, this was all linked with one moat with water in around the whole thing. Um, and basically this eventually um, was dug out um, and then these other buildings were built. 
Interesting, now, this tower here is a rather interesting tower. Even though the plan said this was built in the 1400s, the gateway is attributed to Payne de Turberville. If anyone gets an opportunity to go to Coiti, do so. It might be a damnable Norman um, castle, but it's a really interesting castle nevertheless. So um, if we want to do the checklist, what's there at the time of Llewellyn Bren is this wall, uh, this wall, that wall, the ditch going all the way around the outside, uh, this tower, uh, all this curtain wall, um, but um, the stuff that isn't there, for example, if trying to picture the scene, that's not really there, that's not really there, that's not there, that's not there, that's not there. And the ditch here isn't there either. Um, and if anyone's wandering around the grounds and they find a reproduction bodkin, it's one that I fired off when I was doing a talk there about um, 15 years ago. And it's mine, thank you very much. Um, so moving on again. So, um, so we've entered the story of Coity into this. So Flewellyn incurred the wrath of de Turberville um, because he came to the defense of the, the people of the area. He was charged with sedition by Edward II. Flewellyn then, um, Flewellyn did appeal to um, Edward II, um, you know, for problems to cease. There was a bit of an uprising, a, 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 there were a few problems, you know, a few villages burnt. That was how it went. You know, there was nothing major in 1315. But Edward said, he said, right, you'll have a fair trial in front of the English Parliament. And Llewellyn Brent said, hang on a minute, that don't sound very fair to me. But strangely enough, he actually had friends. Um, he actually had friends and um, in, in the um, Norman aristocracy. But anyway. Um, in 1316, on the 28th of January, um, Llewellyn decided to flee um, back, you know, back to St. He, he was not going to have a petty rebellion anymore. He was going to have a proper rebellion. Doesn't that sound really brave of him, Gillian? Very brave. He was going to do that complete raping and pillaging that all Welsh hero needs to do. Um, or in other words, if we want to look at it from the other side, all the things that a true hero of the people of Cymru, i.e. releasing them from the Norman fist, you know, that's what he wanted to do. So 28th of January 1316, Llewellyn began the revolt by a surprise attack on a very um, important castle. Not this one. Um, that's the um, coat of arms of the de Turberville family. But he decided to attack this castle. Now, do you know which castle this is, Gillian? Is it Caffili? Correct. You are there. Caffili, interesting. So, so what, we, what we've got, so um, um, he, he decided that he was gonna, um, he was gonna do something very bold, attack Caffili Castle, which is very bold indeed. Um, and so what, what he then, he captured the constable outside the castle, um, and then he captured the outer ward. Now, anyone who knows where the, where the outer ward is, that's the outer ward. He captured all this, and this is the inner ward. Um, so he captured this, not sure whether he captured any of this, and the town of Caffili is going to be over this side, probably a few houses over here as well. So, um, so he, he captures the outer ward, um, and how did he manage to capture the constable? Well, it was a Sunday, um, and the, cap the constable of the castle went to church, and basically he allowed the constable to go to the service, and then Llewellyn Bren, as the constables coming out, say, hey, yeah, mate, um, you're now under my control and I want your castle. Um, so that's basically what happened. So what happened is that um, Llewellyn Bren failed to get into the inner part of the castle. But then again, it was probably the first time um, that the defences of Caffili Castle had ever been tested. And actually, um, very interestingly enough, um, Caffili Castle was not impregnable. You know, you could capture bits of it. Um, and it's really unsure whether in the um, Owen Glyndwr Rebellion, a um, hundred years later, whether Caffili Castle was captured or not. Um, and written by English chroniclers, 
who then said that Llewellyn Bren looted and pillaged and slaughtered the inhabitants of Caerphilly. Well, they're going to write that, aren't they? They're going to write that to say how bad uh, Llewellyn Bren actually is. Um, but then again, it's probably unlikely that he slaughtered the people of Caerphilly because those same people of Caerphilly were his own people after all. These, these were sort of, the, you know, the own, his own people that had once been part of the great, large sort of um, a lordship of um, St. Hennif at one point. So he's not even killing people. So that's obviously written by an English historian. Um, and there is the castle itself, Caerphilly. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting castle in that um, it, it's, 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 right, I've got to put, I've got to, put my words in properly, get my teeth in. It's a very interesting castle in that what you mainly see associated with the castle is fantasy because the outside of the wall here, the outside of the wall here, the outside of the wall here, 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 um, here, all these walls were rebuilt um, in the 1870s. Um, so what they actually looked like we don't really know because all the walls were bare because they'd all been looted by people in the medieval period in the Tudor period to actually build the rest of Caerphilly. Uh, but obviously we hope it's very similar to what it may have looked like. Um, and it's, it's a lot bigger now than what it looked like um, back in the day of Llewellyn Bren, back in the year 1316. So let's carry on. Oh, we're back to this castle. Um, we're back to Lantrissant Castle. Mm. Now what I've got, I've got a little map to actually show you where all the revolt is. So um, the rebellion went to Lantrisson Castle and it's likely that Lantrisson Castle was sacked, attacked and burnt to the ground. Um, rather interesting that Lantrisson Castle was sacked, attacked and burnt down to the ground uh, because um, a few years later, it's the same castle that Edward II flees to um, and is eventually captured and held at Lantrisson Castle. So within 10 years, things are very different. So in other words, one interesting thing to say about Llewellyn Bren, Llewellyn Bren was one of, one of the ones responsible, even though he was dead by the time that Edward II was captured, um, by 13, 20, um, 26, 27, um, by the time that the king was captured, um, it, it's, it's likely because so many people disagreed with the execution of Llewellyn Bren uh, that, they, that lots of them turned against the king. But anyway, so we, we've got this castle being burnt to the ground. Um, and there's a nice little uh, black and white illustration of uh, Lantrisson Castle. Um, and then what we then go on to is this one. Um, I know no Dell shouting at the screen. Um, oh, am I going to be bullying you by Gillian by asking you where this could be? Oh, I don't know. And do you know what? Um, we have now got the money to actually um, buy proper film and sound equipment to do little videos. And me and Rosamond will be out here doing a little film and you'll be one of the first people to see it, Gillian. Oh, okay. This is, this is Kenfig Castle. Ah. This is the castle of Kenfig. Now, anyone that knows, you know, this is a slight bit of an overview. Anyone that knows the castle of Kenfig will know the stories associated with the city that's lost in the sand with over about 20 odd churches. Now, um, all that you can really see um, at um, um, Kenfig Castle is the keep. Um, if you go out looking around the landscape, unfortunately, you can't really find this ditch and you can't find this ditch and you can't find this ditch but you might be able to fall into this one because it's really all overgrown. Um, and lots of what we do see, lots of the humps and bumps are actually archeological excavations. Um, so it's a bit odd. Um, the other thing that you can actually say about the landscape is that um, within the surrounding landscape associated with Kenfig um, is a very large town, which is probably where all these ticks are here. Um, and there have been excavations by Time Team. And the last, the Kenfig Archaeological Society no, is no longer going, uh, which, which is a big shame, really. But they excavated there for a very long time. And if you were ever watching Time Team, Gillian, 
this is one of the locations where Time Team actually excavated. So this was actually burnt down to the ground. And this is more like a place um, that would have been completely burnt down to the ground. And it probably led to Kenfig being deserted because this would have been um, a town or city that was occupied by many Normans um, and many Flemish by 1316. So that's the little story about Kenfig. And we, we, we you know, all these sites we'll, we'll probably visit, visit again in the future. But then again, we're looking at the history of Cymru, aren't we? This is rather interesting. This is inside what's left of St. George's Super Ely. Now, if anyone wants to know where all these locations are, we'll look at that in a short while. So uh, St. George's Super Ely is actually, um, um, is, is actually this side of, um, of Cardiff. Um, south of the M4 motorway um, and it's and if you ever go to St George's Super Ely there's a nice pub there and near the church there's um, a building which is actually what's left of the gateway of St George Ely's castle there was a castle mm -hmm. there interesting I think this is inside it, th this is um, this is actually not the view I actually wanted to show you this is the back of the castle the front you can see the gateway I, I didn't manage to get an image of the gateway alas is unfortunate but this is actually now known as castle farm and this is directly on the site of st george's super Ely castle and one thing that the people of st george's super Ely tell you is that the village was destroyed and the castle was destroyed in the revolt of llewellyn bren and interesting enough this site is in monmouthshire this is a site known as llan gibby and llan gibby um is in Monmouthshire. I'll actually show you where that is in a short while. Uh, this is a site that was also excavated by Time Team. It's a castle that has a wall, a rectangular um, enclosure, which has a wall 150 meters in length, which is the length of the platform at Cardiff, um, Cardiff Central Station. So it's really long sort of wall, sort of rectangular castle. Um, and if Rosamond was shouting at the screen, she would say, a bit like Dennis Powers Castle. Well, Dennis Powers Castle is really small compared to this. But again, this is another site that very few people hear about. And it's hidden in a load of trees. You can't actually get there. Um, and this site itself was also the site of a Time Team um, episode. They excavated in here. And one of the strangest things were, was that inside the walls of the castle, they found very little in the form of remains just the walls um, and it's a very strange thing it was probably probably for those that have never heard this word before it was probably a pleasantry a pleasantry for everyone that doesn't know is actually a, a medieval defended walled garden um, hence um, it's called a pleasantry but then again um, this was besieged and captured by the by the men and maybe a couple of women of Llewellyn Bren um, and again this takes us into Monmouthshire and this is another site. This is Denevor Castle. Now, this is rather interesting. Um, only, only um, about 25 years earlier, this was held still by the lords um, of Denevor until they rebelled against Edward I um, in the year, I think we're talking about um, 1291. Um, and this one then went over to Norman hands. Uh, and again, what I think what Llewellyn Bren's trying to say is, right, we've had enough of those damnable Normans. We want to kick them out forever. Let's send them home. Um, and this is another site that was um, besieged um, by the men of Llewellyn Bren. Um, and if those that want a little bit of archaeology, um, this site has been archaeologically excavated, but only a little bit. Now we're back to Cardiff. Interestingly enough, back to Cardiff, and we get we get this little plan here, um, and we go to this site, which we will talk about in a short while. Um, we're, we're back to Cardiff, of all places. Hmm. So it's all over the place, really. This rebellion, strangely enough, and it also involves Barry, and why not? Um, so we, we then go to Cardiff, and Cardiff apparently was raided and burnt to the ground. So his predecessor, the likes of Ivor Bach, had raided Cardiff and captured the likes of the Earl of Gloucester and his wife and his son, Robert. Um, and now, in 1316, um, Llewellyn Bren set torch to Cardiff. It wasn't a very popular site, really. Um, so Cardiff, 
Cardiff was set alight. Um, we don't know how much of the, the castle survived. Um, but within these walls here, um, all this, um, we don't know the fate, but um, it's said that um, towns included Cardiff were raided and buildings burned. Um, and that's all we've got. Um, we don't have the likes of Geraldus Cambrensis writing about this stuff either. So where are we now? Rather interesting. So we've gone to um, this wonderful site I've mentioned that I'm going to still refer to, Lan Gibby. So um, the Rebellion, um, rather interesting landscape. So uh, the Rebellion goes all the way over here, uh, which is very near um, Monmouth, which is slightly over here. Um, so we also find the Rebellion. Hang on a minute. Uh, we also find the Rebellion um, is hit in Cardiff. We also find it's hit in Lantricent. Um, it's hit in um, Caerphilly. Um, and then in a moment, we're going to say it's hitting Castiff Um and, and also um, what we're sort of talking about now, we're also talking about Castiff Cork. So it's a quite widespread rebellion. There's St. George's Castle that I've mentioned. Um, and then we go over to Kenfig, uh, and then we go over to Denevor. So in a way, um, we've got the whole likes of all of this going all the way um, up to here, all the way over to here, back down again. Um, and also Barry uh, is also hit as well. Um, I, I know a historian. Sorry, I didn't. I should have pushed that line a bit further up to. Um, to hear. Um, I know a historian in Barry who, who absolutely hated Llewellyn Bren because Llewellyn Bren built a medieval mill that he was working on in the 1970s and he said if it wasn't for Llewellyn Bren this mill wouldn't have been burnt down to the ground. Very biased um, archaeologist indeed. Um, but then again we go on to a little bit more of the archaeology. So if we clear this screen, thank you very much. Um, and we mentioned this the other day when we did, when we looked at Castiff Moor Grigg. So we're not going to really visit this. So um, what we then have is the likes. So here we go. With all that said, Edward II ordered the Earl of Hereford uh, and the Lord of the neighbouring Brecon to crush the revolt. And he gathered overwhelming forces supported by many of the lords of um, the border landscape including a certain Roger Mortimer. His namesake, a hundred years later, would be a firm supporter of Owen Glyndor. Um, but Roger Mortimer, back in the day, said that he wanted a fair trial for Llewellyn Bren, if Llewellyn Bren was to be captured. So all these Normans weren't, um, weren't bastards in the nicest sense. Troops came from Cheshire and also some... Um, Soldiers from Cymru fought on the side of the Normans and English. In March of the year um, 1316, two months after the revolt started, forces advanced from Cardiff, and in a brief battle at Castiff Moor Grig, which is this site here, here we go, which is believed to be a, 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 um, a, a castle built by the princes of Cymru, um, forced Llewellyn and his men to break off the siege of Caerphilly after six weeks and the Welsh retreated higher up into um, the landscape of Glamorgan. Unfortunately, they were hit between a pincer movement <coughs> because what happened was that Llewellyn um, went all the way up to, um, there it is, I've got it on the map, nice. Um, he went up to this area, Astrid Wachter, and he was surrounded by forces um, from Brecon, Forces coming up from the south, forces from over here, forces from here. So in other words, Llewellyn Bren um, had no hope. Um, so on the 18th of March in 1316, surrendered. And strangely enough, this is a rather, this is when the Normans, other than that horrible um, Hugh Dispenser and Edward II, this is when the Normans actually start to come out as decent people. You'll never hear me say that again, by the way. I, I do apologise. Um, this gallant behaviour um, with the surrender, um, and he said, if I surrender, you are to let my men free. 
earned him the respect of his cap captors, including Roger Mortimer, one of the witnesses to his surrender, and the Earl of Hereford, and both of them promised to intercede on Llewellyn's behalf. He was to um, be treated with respect. With his family, sent to the Tower of London, um, and, you know, he was to have a fair trial. He was to be listened to. Um, and Mortimer said, right, hang, hang on a minute, right. He said, look here, King, right. I don't think he said that, but, you know, look here, uh, King Edward, right. There's a lot of stuff going on in South Wales, right. If you, if you release him, right, pardon him, he'll, he'll, things will settle down in, in, in South Wales and you won't have a problem anymore. Just give him a pardon. Um, and, you know, let his family free and all his men are to be given pardons as well. Unfortunately, Hugh the Younger, Hugh, Hugh the Younger, um, Hugh Dispenser, um, was the person who was to be the custodian of Llewellyn Bren. Now, Hugh was not a nice man, and nor was his father, um, Hugh, um, Hugh Dispenser the Elder. And in 1316, Edward II said, right, Hugh, take him back to Wales with you, right? Take him back to Wales. Without the king's direction, he took Llewellyn Bren back to Cardiff Castle. And unfortunately, Llewellyn Bren was hung, drawn and quartered without a proper trial. And this overnight made Hugh, Hugh Dispenser, the favorite of Edward II, very unpopular. And because he was an ally of Edward II, then made Edward II highly unpopular. When we, when we looked at the story of Llewellyn Bren the other week, I mentioned that he was, his body was buried in the grounds of the Grey Friars, which was unfortunately um, demolished um, back in the late 1960s. So, dissatisfaction grew. Um, and before we do um, a final bit of archaeology, and we actually end in Barry, of all places, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more of the story, Dissatisfaction grew with the dispensers. Um, and in 1321, there was a revolt of the barons. And they said, look what you've done to Llewellyn Bren. The Normans are saying, look what you've done to Llewellyn Bren. He was not given a fair trial. We no longer trusted dispensers in charge of Glamorgan and other parts of Wales and England. And we no longer tr trust you, dear king. And actually, you know the family of Llewellyn Bren? We want them released. So the family of Llewellyn Bren were released and, uh, re released and they went actually back to um, Wales. Um, and actually the wife of Llewellyn Bren, Flechire, went back to Wales. She actually went back to Wales. Um, and unfortunately, no sooner as they'd got to Wales, after 1321, they were imprisoned again by the dispensers. And in fact, this is what led to the war of the barons against the dispensers and Edward II. It was to do with the treatment of Llewellyn Bren's family. Um, and this would cause the dispensers to um, flee from Bristol with the king into the territory of Glamorgan, head towards Lantrisson Castle, and there they are captured and held prisoner in Lantrisson Castle. And you know what happens next. Um, Edward II ends up dying with a poker shoved up his... But let's not spoil it. With the overthrow of Edward II, the estates in St. Henneth were restored on the 11th of February, 1327, to Llewellyn Bren's sons, Gruffydd, um, John, Myrig, Roger, William, and Llewellyn. Um, and the Earls of Hereford made sure that the king, the next king, Edward III, was to pay an allowance to the wife of Llewellyn Bren and she'll, till she died on the 12th of April, 1349. And that's probably one of the only times I'm going to, I'm going to talk fondly 
um, about um, the Normans because they 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 saw that the um, in their eyes the Welsh were being treated very poorly um, and that they might uh, see a rebellion from the people of Cymru in the near future if they didn't sort of ask for forgiveness for the death of this great national hero Llewellyn Bran. So this is a this is a story that you you wouldn't usually hear. Um, now this is rather interesting and why it's rather interesting if any of you go down to the woods today you'll have a great surprise in Porth Kerry and Barry there's no longer a golf course they've got rid of it uh, because it was constantly being flooded and if you go to the golf course and as you go from the cafe uh, down a walk board a gravel path directly in front of you on the uh, directly in front of you before you turn right along the stream the Nant towards the sea it'll have a sign saying um here um near here is a mill and this is a mill that's believed to have been burnt down by Llewellyn Bren uh, and as I say I, I I knew this archaeologist in Barry years ago Howard Thomas and he always used to he always used to say terrible things about Llewellyn Bren this is Llewellyn Bren who who destroyed and burnt down my mill in the 1300s but it's a rather interesting mill actually and it's likely as well um, that the castle of Barry was also burnt down as well in the Llewellyn Bren revolt so you know we can add Barry to that we actually um, other than the other than the mention of um, the de Barry family associated with Gerald de Barry and Geraldus Cambrensis and all that stuff from the 1188 and 1191 you don't really hear a lot about Barry in history, but you do hear about Barry in history associated with Llewellyn Bren. He made a beeline for Barry and burnt down this mill and, and the um, castle of Barry. Um, and it was never, the mill was never ever used again. So we're told. Um, there was another mill erected in Barry and that was used as the milling um, for, the, um, for the lordship, the sub lordship of Barry after 1316 and i would like to say as well something i've completely missed um other than the dispensers treating the the people of glamorgan a little bit of gwent and um west wales terribly there was also um there was also famine because in 1315 1316 these were the years of the two great famines and those two great famines um put the people of, of, the, of the land through great hardship. And the last thing they needed was Hugh Dispenser, the younger, taxing them more. And they didn't really have much to give because, um, you know, I've told you the story, the, um, it was so unfair back then. If you had 10 bags of grain at the end of it, you'd only have about three left. One was to feed the family after taxes. One was to plant the next year and one was to take to market. Mm. If um, Hugh Dispenser's saying, you know that, that bag you need to take to market, right? <coughs> I'm having that in the tax. People ain't happy with that. And it's also said one thing, and you're not going to read about this either. Um, it's also one, one thing that's actually said, and I don't know what happened to my image of Castle Corth, but you're not missing much. Um, one, one, thing that, um, one thing that has to be said is that down here, at um, Taft's Wells, it's believed there's a mill which was built and frequented by Llewellyn Bren himself, overlooked by the castle known as Castell Coch today. And interesting enough, we do know, if you ever go to Castell Coch, somebody used to work for me, is still a custodian there, um, Coralie Blackman. Um, if you say, oh, um, can I see the where the original part of the castle of Llewellyn Bren used to be. She will show you because you can actually still see bits of the original castle there. They were kept um, by um, the, um, William Burchess. Um, um, and if, if you do search and you do ask nicely, you can actually still see the original walls of the castle of Llewellyn Bren. And on that note, I think that would be a wonderful end to today's lecture. Um, so what I'd like to do is, um, Gillian, you have the first question before I put the mics on. Anything you'd like to say, lovely? Um, no, I don't think so. That was really good. A lot of it I didn't know. Um, it, it's one of those lectures that um, 
if you do search, you can find really nice bits and pieces um, in the um, really nice uh, bits and pieces in the in the history books. <coughs> Not so much online, but I, what I'm going to show you is this is um, this is one of Michelle's purchases. Uh, this is I think this cost um, this cost about eleven pound I think. So this is uh, there you go. Can you see that? Not from, really. Uh, 1874. Ah. Anyway, it's my green screen that is, uh, but that's the book. You can see it there. Can you see that? Good. Excellent. Yeah. So if you haven't got any other questions, um, Gillian, I'm going to ask if anyone else has questions. And can I ask you iPhone um, 8, 7 is, please? That's the first question I'm going to ask when I put you all on. Um, who is iPhone 8, 7? Um, unmute all. And there's one person that I, um, um, what, what we're going to do, um, there's one or two people who don't like um, sort of talking and making themselves known. So what I'm going to ask is that if anyone's got any questions, um, Dell, have you got any questions? I'm eight, seven. Was it? Oh, which one? Oh, you're Eleanor. Yes, I do. This is Eleanor. Right. No, Eleanor. Nice to see you, Eleanor. Nice to see you. Uh, um, Go two on. points. Uh, I remember Greyfriars, the ruins in Greyfriars Road, and I was very sad when they disappeared. I thought that was such a shame. Um, <laughs> and in San Blethian, where I lived, um, the castle there, uh, apparently it hadn't been finished when uh, Gilbert de Clare, who owned the land and the castle, went to Bannockburn and the villagers stole, while he was away, stole all the stone from the castle to build their cottages. And, and, and I tell you what, that's that's probably true. <laughs> that's probably true. And actually, yeah. actually, strangely enough, I, I mentioned a story like this the other day. You know, Lantris and Castle. Um, in my Bridge End class, I've got a guy by the name of George. And as I was chatting away one day, he said, that, "Oh, um, I, I didn't know um, the castle was a, a protected ancient monument when I took a load of stone from there 50 years ago to build the castle nearby, <laughs> to build a cottage nearby. He built one of the local cottages out of stone from the castle 50 years yeah, ago." Yeah. Yeah. Um, and his believe. name, yeah, exactly. You can believe it. Um, anything else, Eleanor? No, I think that's it. Uh, right. Thank you. For good, good. Thank you for that. And Dell, have you got anything you'd like to say? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for bringing alive um, a little-known part of our history in the South. Um, it's interesting that this revolt was after the Llewellyn, the last revolt in North Wales. And people tend to think, right, that's it. Um, Welsh, um, uh, all the revolts then are over until Owain Glyndwr. But they're not. But this one is in between. And mm -hmm. it, I find that really fascinating and annoyed that it's not widely known and not advertised as part of our general history. You, you will find with tomorrow's lecture about the English Armada, I get very, very angry. Um, and um, I've annoyed a couple of people in, on my Tuesday evening because I get very sort of upset with the fact that so much of history is, is being wiped out and eradicated to suit a political aim. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and you add, I agree with everything you said, um, Del. Um, so I, I won't go around everyone, but um, Goff, uh, have you got anything you'd like to add? I can't hear Goff. Like usual. Goff? Okay, Rosamond, we'll have Goff in a minute. Rosamond, anything you'd like to say? Um, no, I found it all very interesting. It's all new stuff to me. Um, and it's good to hear the history of, of Wales and the rebellion and... and who was doing what and where? Of course, we got a mill. We would have had a mill in Dinis Powys, but I, you know, need to learn more about that. We need to find it. And, and Rosamond, can you stay in the class behind? I, I need to chat with you afterwards. Um, Goff, okay. any 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 news from you? Oh, uh, news. No, what gonna... news? Anything you want to say? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that I'm I'm 69 and I didn't learn any Welsh history when I was in school, so this is all fascinating. I, I, I really appreciate that. And um, well, to be honest with you, I'm 45 and I didn't um, learn any history um, from Wales when I was in school either. So that's, you know, nothing much changed. Um, anyone, anyone, any, anyone want to say anything else? Just shout out now. 
um, the, I love the aerial shots of the castles, you know, the real life ones that uh, really gave you a look, see what it's like. It's great. More of that tomorrow. More, more of that tomorrow. More, more of that um, in the future. And also, I haven't mentioned next week, we're going to be looking at um, musical instruments. And um, you'll be able to look at a reconstructed medieval instrument, if I can acquire it from Michelle, um, next week as well. Um, and maybe I'll get her playing it. Anyone else want anything to say before we go? Shout out now. Yeah, Carol, it's, it's Catherine. I, I just had a question. I mean, obviously, being Scottish, I, I don't know the wasn't taught Welsh history, but um, on the Kenfig you mentioned, um, you know, there's a big sand dunes there now. W would they have been there at, at this period? Or? What, what, what's happening is that if, if you think about Ogmore, uh, and you think about Merth and Mower, um, as, as, the lands as the landscape is being extensively uh, farmed, um, you know, the, the soil is loosened, there's not many trees, the sand dunes start to rush in. Um, and this is what's happening in, across that landscape. And the other thing as well is, um, it's, it's almost as if you, you get sort of warrens for rabbits and so on, and, and they're sort of eating away um, the ground matter and there's no root systems and everything's dying off and the sand just blows in. Um, so, you know, think things are changing. It, no, people, people give the idea that there's a massive sandstorm and, and um, billions of tons of sand cover the area. It's not like that at all. It's a gradual thing. As buildings are abandoned, sand moves in and this is what's happening. So, so those, those dunes, those are moving dunes and, 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 and it's a gradual process. So, um, yeah. So, so, so you don't think they were they were so extensive that in this pe in the period you've talked about? The the sand has always been there, but what's happening is it's 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 the moving dunes, um, mm. and there's a lot of erosion going on as well. And with that erosion, is creating sand. Um, and to be honest with you, the answer is we can guess, um, but there's so much that we don't know, particularly along the coast. Um, mm. Anyone want to say something else? Anyone got one last thing to say, please? Okay, nobody else. So what I'm going to do, um, as I say, next week, musical instruments. I look forward to anyone seeing you on Saturday. We're doing Abathor. A lot more history with that, with that side of things on Saturday. Forum next Wednesday. Those that I'll be seeing tomorrow as well. Um, and I'll be seeing you all next Wednesday. It's, it's been great that we've, we've had 11 people today. And... Um, and it's good. It's good that we've um, we've got a nice crowd tonight. Anyone who wants to stay behind for a little chat at the end is very welcome. But um, and the, including Rosamond. So what I'm going to do? Nobody's got anything else to say. I'm going to say good night, Catherine, Pat, Peter, good night. Rosamond, good night. Alice, good night. Gillian, good night. Goff, good night. Um, good night. Um, Ellie. Um, anyone else? Tomorrow. And Alice yeah. and Dell. And I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Take care. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everyone, even if I missed your name up. Um, right, Rosamond, just a quick call. Um, yeah. Just a quick call. Um, I, it's just talking out of my head, but um, if, if you know, you know in Lantwick Major? Yes. Think about this, right? Um, if, we retained, if we retained the meeting place for a meeting once a month that I didn't attend, but one of you could have internet access to maybe, um, I would still be in, in the Ronda, but obviously if anyone wants to come along, it would act as a, as a, as a hub point. But um, mm. I'm just thinking that in top of my head, but the thing is it would be restricted. Um, you could only have about, um, we would say to people, those that can do Zoom, fine. But then again, those that can't, this is your opportunity and would restrict it to about six people or something. So that's an yeah, idea, that it's like, not, it's yeah. an idea. That sounds like a plan, doesn't it? Yes, it because does. I think there is the feeling that people do still want to meet together, and I get that. They because do, but yes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But but to give that option, yes. yes. Um, and obviously. And what, what do you mean? You, so you do your, your Zoom lecture? Yes, I would. I would do the Zoom lecture on that on that one sort of Thursday morning, months a month, and. Um, those and that, then people would gather at a certain place. They, they would gather at the existing place that we have meetings, but we would say it, it would have to be limited numbers. Because the thing is, um, one thing I want to avoid is, um, yeah, we can't go back teaching the classes. That, that has to be avoided. 
the other thing as well is the thing that w the people will be seeing me will be a monthly walk so there you go yeah i think that sounds like a plan because what's you wouldn't actually physically be in Lanswick major though no i wouldn't i wouldn't no no there'd be like a computer screen or something like that there yeah that's what we would do yeah and then the people who were there would all watch the screen yes yeah that sounds like a plan for the, for those people but it, it, it's only an idea because michelle's um michelle um um you know we, we me and michelle need to chat about this so there you go yeah so, I think at the moment you're putting it out there that there's not going to be a meeting place. Maybe there, it might there, be sort of stay with that for the for the moment. There, there won't be because the universities are now saying that um, they won't be having lectures and so on for a whole year. Yeah, um, they're going to go online, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're going to go online. And the, the other point as well is is that the government has um, lock, lockdown directives. So at any minute, the government could say no meetings, no oh. nothing is locked down. I'm not, we're not going down that avenue. So it's just an idea. Anyway, Rosamond, I'm going to have to yeah, dash great. in a minute. Thanks. You've got great. 30 seconds for anything else you want to say? No? No, that was great. Le a great lecture. I'm still learning loads. Good. And you will keep yes. learning loads. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thanks okay. very much, Carl. Tired now. <laughs> See you in the morning. See you in the morning, Rosamond. Take care. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.